philosophical background in this place. Historically now, Apollo's religion must have begun somewhere in the 9th century BC in this place. Previously, people lived here. They worshipped a female deity. When you go into the museum, the very first exhibits that you'll see are the little Mycenaean ceramic statuettes. You'll see the little statuettes. They look like a... Like, they've got wings because their hands are like outstretched like that. And it's very, very modernistic, if you will, stylistic. But they've got teeny weeny breasts, which points to a female deity, right? A female goddess. So that means probably that Gaia was the goddess supposed to be worshipped here, alright? And then Apollo somewhere in the 9th century. The thing is, with Apollo's religion, you have a very organised religion. Prophecies were given once a month on the seventh day of the month. On the seventh day, because the seventh of the ancient month Vitius was Apollo's birthday. Okay? The ancient month Vitius would be the end of February for us today, which means that for the local farmer who needs farming advice from the god, getting his prophecies for starters on the beginning of, in the end of February, not only does he celebrate the god's birth and have a religious festival, but he gets good advice when he needs it, his crops do fine. So these locals will advertise stuff really, really quickly around Greece. And when the Greeks in the 9th and 8th centuries BC build their colonies all around the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, and they take the name of Delta with them, by the end of the 8th century BC, you have gifts from non-Greeks being sent to Delta. Because Delta is different, it's great. Now, there's actually four major oracles in the ancient world. In northwestern Greece, up in the mountains, Sedona dedicated to Zeus. Here in Delphi, Apollo. Sertophia in the Shiwa Desert, in Libya, Amon Ra. And in Asia Minor, another oracle dedicated to Apollo at Dodima. Those are the four major oracles. All four have great advice to give. And all four have no religious prerequisites. What did I just say? Three different gods. Zeus, Apollo, and Amon-Ra. Well, Amon-Ra is an Egyptian god. Why would I consult an Egyptian god? On the other hand, why not? In the ancient world, there's no, no, no sense of my god's better than yours. When I'm in Egypt, it's much easier for me to go to, to Libya to consult the oracle of Amon-Ra there, rather than to come up here. It's practical. You worship the god that best suits you, rather than the god that you must worship. Just imagine what that means. That means no religious fanaticism. That means one important reason less for a war to begin. It means tolerance. It means a much easier coexistence, really. Okay. So what does Delphi have that the others don't have? Why did Delphi become the biggest of the four? Why did people from all over the world come to Delphi and not up to Dodona or to Amon-Ra in the Shiwa Desert or to Apollo and Dodema? Think of the map of the world. Black Sea, Mediterranean. Delphi is the most central of those spots. It's not up in the mountains, it's not halfway through the desert, it's not in Asia Minor. Not only is it almost in halfway between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean and, you know, the, the Straits of Gibraltar, if you will, but it's also very close to the sea, with the river in those days big enough for you to navigate up. So it's one of the most, well, it's probably the most accessible of the ancient sanctuaries, of the ancient oracles, rather, not sanctuaries. So, by the 7th century, we see prophecies are given on the 7th day of every month for the nine months of the year when Apollo's present in Delphi to people from all over the world, no matter where they come from. All right, and say that you start out from Asia Minor, all right? How are you going to get to Delphi? By ship. No engines to your ships, right? So you depend on what to get you here? The wind. That means that you can't necessarily plan to get here on the 6th of the month, get your prophecy on the 7th and leave on the 8th. <laughs> and then again, say that you do get here on time. There's no one to tell you that you will get a prophecy this month. The priest of Delphi will always, before giving you a prophecy, check to see whether it's an auspicious day for you. And if it's not, you'll have to wait another month. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of the 5th century, we see the Athenians got a prophecy that terrified them, and they opted to stay another month as well, and get, hopefully, a better prophecy. So you, you can't calculate the duration of your stay in Delphi. You may stay a month, a week, two weeks, two months, who knows? So where will you stay? What will you eat? Everything you need, you bring with you. You bring your tent, your cooks, your food, your servants, the animals to be sacrificed are brought with you. And no matter how funny that sounds, just think of how many different goats you find in so many different countries. But you could see all those different goats here because you'd bring your own goats with you. Or bulls or roosters, depending on what you could afford. And what else would you bring to Delphi as a gift to the gods? What do we see in museums? Other than many statues. Well, those statues are sent ready-made, aren't they? So they represent your artistic style. And when they're set up all along the sacred path of Delphi, you end up with Delphi being possibly the biggest art gallery of the ancient world, with all the different art represented.
And of course today you don't have the statues and the buildings are in ruins. But when you walk through the site, you'll see inscriptions almost everywhere, giving you the history behind the monuments, right? So it's a huge history book as well. Let's make this long story short. People from all over the world share common camping grounds. So they talk to each other. They learn about each other from each other. You'll smell and taste each other's different food. Imagine all the fires cooking different foods from all over the world. And when you walk through here, you look at each other's art and architecture and read each other's history. What you have here in Delphi, that very simply the biggest, and if you will, most productive cultural centre of the ancient world. History was made here. When, think of the UN, delegates go to the UN today to discuss politics. Same thing happened here in Delphi. That's what Delphi is for the world. And this is the stone you'll find later on in the museum, right? And it symbolises Delphi's importance to the ancient world. What does this symbolise? Mm -hmm. The centre of the world. What's at the centre of our bodies? At the centre of our bodies. That's the navel. The navel, right? The belly button. So, if the belly button is the centre of the world, uh, the centre of our bodies, and Delphi is the centre of the world, Delphi is the, the belly button of the world. <laughs> As a symbolism. It's just to tell you how important it is. Because recently, archaeologists have taken this symbolism a step further. And they claim that the design on this stone is the umbilical cord. So it's just like nutrition goes to the, uh, to the embryo through the umbilical cord. Just imagine how many things you'd learn when you came to Delphi in those days. Symbolically wise, this is the central point. Seventh down to fourth centuries BC, Adelphi's glory then. Fourth century BC, Alexander the Great, um, uh, rather Philip II, Alexander's father comes along. He starts bossing people about, which means that as a city state, there's not much room for you to consult the Oracle of Delphi on individual politics, because Philip tells you what to do. So that's when Delphi's decline begins. But to, to your average person of the 4th century BC, Delphi remains important, because Philip gets a prophecy, Alexander gets a prophecy, everyone who can gets a prophecy. It's just that now it is used solely for political reasons, it's to influence the people governed by Philip and Alexander. Look at what Delphi said, now you have to listen to this. And it's in the Roman days when the decline is visible. Because a Roman emperor isn't going to bother... You've come from Italy, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, well, you know how far away it is. Mm -hmm. It wasn't much closer in those days, <laughs> right? So the Roman emperor is not going to bother to leave Rome and come to consult the Oracle of Delphi. Plus the fact it's a bit of an ego thing as well, right? I'm the Roman emperor, I don't need to consult the ancient world. Because that's the clinch, you see. For the Romans, this is already ancient. We consider the Romans ancient. <laughs> this to them is ancient. Delphi becomes part of, of the tour of the ancient world. Tourism developed in the Roman days, when the starters, the Roman emperor and his officials, and eventually upper class Romans who can afford to, will come see these sites solely out of curiosity to see the sites of the past. That's tourism, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, when you have tourists, you have shops, right? There's a Roman shopping centre. See the little shops? Brick and stone walls, you've probably seen enough of them already. Typically Roman. Look at the Roman shops. That's where you buy your souvenirs, from Delphi in the Roman days. There's actually a great book written, written by Lindsay Davis, the British writer, called See Delphi and Die. <laughs> <laughs> Not a very auspicious oh. title, is it? Uh, but it's actually about a Roman tour group who visit the ancient sites and Delphi amongst them. So look out for that book. Now, in the 4th century AD, an earthquake destroyed this place. And the Byzantine Emperor Theodosius came along and said, right, you can no longer worship the gods of Olympus, it's illegal, ancient sanctuaries are shut, they no longer have games in honour of the gods, Delphi is destroyed anyway, no one's going to rebuild it. What happens is the Christians of the area will come along and use it as a stone quarry. Hmm. Pliny the Elder mentions 3,000 gold bronze and silver statues, right? Well, they were all melted down and recycled by the Christians of the area because that's what they needed. And then again, you've all this, got all, all this ancient stone. Look at how nicely shaped these pieces are. So ready cut, free stone. <laughs> so on and off, for almost two centuries, this place served as a stone quarry to the first Christians who built their houses and villages in the area. And then it just got covered up, dirt and dust and whatnot. Somewhere in the 10th century AD, this was built over the ancient site. Hmm. That's being a whole village, right? Of course, a lot of ancient stone was used to build the houses of the village, so the people pretty much always knew that Delphi was under here. But the people of the village weren't willing to move until 1892, when the Greek and French governments agreed that the French would pay for the excavation 
but they also cover the cost of a new village. So the people who lived here, these houses are taken apart, pieces apart to save the ancient material, and the rest was used as rubble to build the village we stayed in last night, mm. the one village we built. Okay, so that's the history of this site. Right. Now, any questions so far?